Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. Welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. And today we're going to speak about, well, we're going to do a recap rather, um, of the interview that I did with Lynn Harwood. So Lynn shared some great insights in our interview and we talked about getting the skills of managing your people, but also have them managing you. So have that managing out perspective. And and what Lynn was talking about is creating leaders within your team rather than followers, right? So um, looking at how we can actually create within our team a multitude of leaders that can then do that space of, you know, helping you by managing you, right, and also by managing them. And this is something that I don't see a lot in leadership because we have um, this space where as leaders we feel like we need to be the ones that are leading and not actually be thinking about how we can lead from within or how we can lead from behind. There's this misconception that we have to be out the front, that we have to be taking them on a journey somewhere rather than actually understanding that if we can empower them to get to a level where they're on their own journey, um, that is actually going to meet the goals and the objectives of the team or the organization, then all we need to do is guide them along the way rather than striding out. And, you know, she talked about as well the difference between management and leadership. And, you know, management is doing things right, making sure things are done in the right way, making sure that we're ticking all those boxes, but leadership is doing the right thing. It's not about what you're doing more so than who you are and what you're becoming. So what you're doing is a management thing. Who you are and how you're doing it is a leadership thing. And it's looking at what's right for the organization. Like what's the priorities in the organization that we need to be achieving and how can we do that from a leadership perspective? So how can we do that from doing the right thing rather than a management perspective by just ticking the boxes and doing those things right? And this really resonated with me because even the Ripple Effect Leadership Psychology Program that I've put together is about not, well, there is some aspects there that's about how you do things, but most of it, majority of it is about who you need to become to be a great leader and how you can then use those tips and techniques to be able to not only become a great person, a great leader, and a great influencer, but how you can use that to be able to then model for your group and actually create greatness in them, right? And again, as I mentioned, influencer, it's about influencing your team to be able to have them also doing the right thing and have them growing and evolving at the same rate. And in one of the concepts I often talk about is the me, we community level thinking, And leadership sits in that community level thinking. It's about how can we do the right thing for the whole community? What's the right decisions to make? What are the right actions to take? How do we manage these people correctly? And how do we lead them correctly where we need to be? Lynn and I also spoke about how we understand the people within our team. So getting to understand them is real key in understanding their temperaments, understand what makes them tick, you know, understand those that you need to check in a lot more times, so those that need your time and those that can actually work solo and just run, you know, with limited supervision and limited check-ins. And, and this aligns a little bit with um, what we're saying here, pretty much aligns a little bit with the second module of that program I mentioned earlier and how we can understand people better. And even Stephen Covey actually says, you know, seek first to understand, then be understood. And and when he says that in his seven habits of highly effective people, you know, 
in the past, we thought, oh, we just need to build really close relationships with our team. But, you know, that can present problems as well, because when we're in a space where we've got a really close relationship, sometimes that can prevent us from having the conversations we need to have. So it's not so much about having friendships within your team, but it's about understanding them. What, how do they feel significant? And how can you use that to be able to influence them and create greatness in them? You know, what four roles um, do they play? Where do they sit in that? You know, what are their love languages? How can you connect with them and make them feel valued and make them feel enough so that they're in a safe space to continue growing and, and continue serving at their highest level? And, you know, in the past we've had, um, and I've seen it a lot in some of the companies I've been in, there's, especially at the moment, we've got such a limited talent pool to be able to draw from, right? All industries are experiencing shortages in that labor market. So we've got these people that are really great at being able to have technical skills, execute the job. You know, they've got that um, great way of thinking and that great mindset. And so we automatically think, hey, we'll promote them. We'll make them supervisors or we'll make them leaders. And that's great, but then a lot of the time we fail to give them the training on how to do that properly. So they're coming into this space from this real technical mindset and this me, we mindset of how do I get this job done and, and what do I do without understanding how to think about the community. And when things go wrong, we then throw them under the bus, right? But we're not giving them the skills to get them to the next level, to be able to create success at the next level. We need to give them the tools, the techniques, the training to create a world where they can thrive rather than that environment that's preventing them from thriving. And um, Lynn spoke about that being the Peter principle, right? Employing someone to their level of incompetence. And sometimes we employ people to their level of incompetence um, and we leave them there and we don't actually think about how can we increase that competency within them. Leadership, although some people have some natural flair, it's not always something we're born with. It's something we can learn. It's something we can share with the other people within our team. And, and that's the focus that creates those leaders in your team rather than the followers in your team. And we tend to forget as well that when we are leading and we're in that leadership space, you know, that's taking up a lot of our time, you know, really leading effectively means that we're giving a lot of time to the people in our team. And that limits the time for us to do those day-to-day -day tasks. So when someone's elevated into a position and not given the training and that understanding, they may tend to be really focused on the task and not allocating that time for the team. So that's where things can break down a fair bit. We also thought talked about authenticity, right? So Lynn and I spoke about how inauthenticity, so when we're not being authentic, can actually be picked up by people. And when it's picked up by people, it can take them into a space where they don't trust the person that's being inauthentic. And so when we are not being authentic as leaders, then we're potentially setting that up for ourselves where people won't trust us because what we think and what we say and what we do all needs to be in sync. And when it's not in sync, when it's not all connecting together, you can pick that up. And, you know, you don't even have to be believer of big woohoo and big energy science to know that you've done it yourself. You know, we've got that inner um, lie detector, I suppose, or that little detector that goes, oh, something just doesn't feel right there. They're saying this and they're doing this, but it just doesn't feel like they're meaning this. Okay, so we can all do this and we tend to forget sometimes that if we can do it, then our team can do it from us. So we need to be having that space where we're actually being authentic with the team. And another key element that creates greatness in teams and creates that environment where people are thriving and really wanting to contribute is making sure that you have the right people there. And one of the things Lynn said that really, again, resonated with me was the best thing you can do for your staff for your great staff, for the staff that are the high achievers or the consistent achievers is to remove the not so good staff, you know, remove the people that aren't really achieving. And, and we don't have to always remove them by taking them out of the team. We can remove them by upskilling those people because sometimes when we have the conversations with them about, Hey, this isn't really being done right, or we need some advances here. They usually tend to look at us or at times they tend to look at us and say, Oh, I had no idea. Oh, 
or you can pick that up in the conversation. So people aren't always purposely not doing the right thing. Sometimes they just don't know. And and we're at fault too as leaders in a lot of the spaces where we may have failed to set the objectives for them or they may not have measurables to be able to work towards. And, and that's another unit in that program that I um, have put together is looking at how you can manage performance. Doesn't have to always be bad performance. It can be good performance as well. But how can you manage the performance to get the best out of your people? What sort of things do you need to do? How can you set accountability and set some KPIs and, and set the objectives for people so they know what path to walk on? You know, as in, an employee, at some point, I've been in that space where I'm on this tangent, I'm thinking I'm doing a great job. And someone said to me, you've just totally missed the mark. But they didn't tell me along the way. They didn't guide me. They just told me at the end point. So for me, that became really frustrating. And I wasn't, you know, I like to serve. Um, I've got that carer and achiever in me and I like to be able to do my best work. And when I can't do my best work, that frustrates me. And that then drops my morale and it drops my ability to be able to go in at that, that level that I need to, to be able to serve well. So Lynn also spoke about being pleasantly persistent in this space, right? So our standards are what we're prepared to walk past. And so when we're looking at those people, you know, that aren't so great, if we're able to walk past them and allow them to be, then that's the standard that we're setting for the rest of the team. That's what we're showing in are our expectations. So don't walk past things that you don't want in your organization. Yeah. Another thing that we can tend to be guilty of is something not going right. And us saying, Oh, I'll address that. Um, Oh, I'm busy today. I'll talk to him tomorrow. Oh, something's happened. I can't talk to him tomorrow. Then a couple of days in, it's really doesn't feel right to talk to them anymore. And so we're avoiding those conversations that could be creating the change we need, or could be creating the growth in the other people. And you know, we tend to not always look at it as we should because those conversations need to be viewed by us less as difficult and hard and uncomfortable and yuck and more as our ability to serve. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. You know, we're actually being able to help these people grow and evolve. And that's what we're there for as leaders. And so shifting into that space and shifting the mindset then shifts the energy we take to it as well, right? Because when we're going into something that we feel is yucky and uncomfortable, we're bringing that apprehensive energy in and people can sense it. So you sit down to have the conversation again, like I said before, we've got this internal sensor and they sense they go, oh, something's going wrong. And so when you speak as well, the words that you use are aligned with those thoughts that you were thinking. And so your message isn't coming across as clear as you would like it to be. The other person then may get triggered. And then you have this space where your thoughts are confirmed. It is comfortable. It is yucky. But if you can come in there from that space of okay, I want to do this because I want to help this person, or I'm doing this because I'm going to be able to share with them something that can help them grow. Your energy, your speech, your words, terminology, the way that you approach it, your nature, your body language, everything is aligned with that. And the person will feel it and they'll be more open and receptive and less triggered in that space. So we have, um, you know, then a place where we've been able to adjust the behaviors of the le- the lower performers or they've chosen to leave or we've had to move them on, whatever that ends up being. And then we look at the rest of our team, right? Because like um, Lynn says as well, a team of superstars will always do um, more. Sorry, a team of superstars. Let me get this right. I need to get it right. I don't want to stuff it up. So a team of superstars, that's it, will do, always do less than a superstar team. So even though we're adjusting the behavior of people within the team, it's not about having full team of achievers, 
right? Because then there's going to be conflict in that space too, because they're all going to be wanting to outachieve each other. But it's about having the superstar team. It's about creating that team that complements each other, that's on the same path, that's on the same objectives, that actually has healthy conflict. And if you have a space where you identify unhealthy or unhelpful conflict, then as a leader, we need to address that as that happens. And then we need to check in again, because sometimes when we've got a team, especially really large teams, if we're sitting at the head of an organization or we've got, you know, different teams under us, we'll address something and then we'll think, oh, that's done. But human nature is that's probably going to be great for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, but people may revert back to their old behaviors. So it's also about that review process, right? And going back in and double checking and just seeing how that's going in that space. And, you know, that comes back to that team dynamic, right? The team dynamic creates greatness bigger than the sum of all the parts, as as Lynn said. So we need to gel together and rise up together rather than getting in that space where we're pushing each other down or pushing one person down or, you know, not actually having the conducive space um, to rise together is what often causes teams to fail. And that also causes, you, you know, some of your best performers to leave because they don't want to be in an environment where they're having to struggle or compete. They just want to get in there and do their job and do it well. Um, you know, I, I often speak about, you know, handing out tickets to the bus and seeing who wants the ticket. And those who want to get on the bus can get on the bus and those who don't, don't have to get on, right? They've got other options. This world is such a huge place, so many jobs, so many opportunities that they don't always have to get on the bus if that's not what they're aligned to. But Lynn mixed that up a little bit, which I loved. And she said, it's not just about people being on or off the bus, but they also need to be on the right seat of the bus. And I really liked that because sometimes we miss that element of it. We think, oh, we've got all these great people, but if we aren't having them or putting them in the right space, then they're not able to perform at the level that's going to help the team. And, and we speak about that with the four um, roles that people play. You know, sometimes the rebel can be really difficult to manage because they're purposely breaking rules. They, they won't follow them because they're wired from a subconscious level to be a rule breaker. And that can be really difficult if you've got them in a space that's really systemized and they have to be able to follow those systems and processes. However, if you have them like in a sales role or somewhere else where they're able to actually go out and break the mold and step outside the square, then they're going to thrive. So sometimes it's not always about shifting someone out of your team as well. Sometimes it's about shifting them around in your team and giving them the roles that actually mean that they're on the right seat of the bus. And that's going to create that team, that superstar team, rather than having team of superstars all in the wrong spots. And when we were talking before about some people not being high performers, I think we need to recognize as well that everything has a life cycle. You know, plants have a life cycle. Our relationships have a life cycle. You know, if we're parents, our kids grow up and move out. There's a life cycle for everything and everything's always changing. It's one of the one, one of the rules, universal rules, right? Everything is subject to change. And that can affect us in so many different ways if we're not understanding and being open to that. But that also means that people have a life cycle within an organisation, so we need to recognize when we're coming to the end of the life cycle and the end of the journey with the organization. And, and I've had that in a few different positions I've had. And I, I mentioned it in the interview with Lynn, where I've probably outstayed the life cycle and ended up not being as great a performer and not being able to deliver at my high standard because of whatever reason, you know, being affected by other people. Um, I haven't always had this same level of emotional intelligence. So I've been in spaces where I've been jaded and, and that's come through in my work. So, you know, recognizing that you're coming to the end of the life cycle and as a leader, recognizing that your team member may be coming to the end of the life cycle is really important because when we can recognize it, then we can assist and help them further. So being a leader isn't just about getting high-performing teams and hitting those KPIs and those objectives. It is about serving the people around us. and when we recognize that someone's coming to the end of the life cycle, we can recognize them by helping them get to their next space, helping them find another role that they're interested in, maybe a promotion within the business, you know, making that end enjoyable rather than bitter and, and making sure that there are no bridges burnt. 
Now, that person may even leave the organization, but by doing that, you've got a really strong advocate for the company that you were working for or for any other initiatives that you're going to implement, you know, or they may come across someone that's looking for a role or a job and they'll go, oh, go work there. They've been absolutely fantastic. So you've got a little marketer, right, out and about because you've helped serve them in that space. And so the the ending of that cycle doesn't need to be unpleasant for the employee or for the members or the team or for the leader or the organization. If it's actually identified really well from the leader, then we can actually put the things in place that are going to make it a pleasant experience. And we want to, I know in, in the the corporate role I had before I actually went out and started Get Up and Grow Consulting. I was in a space where when I was speaking to the director, I, I said, I think it's time for me to leave. I, I want to go out as the Brownlow medalist, not with a hamstring injury, right? And a lot of the times we don't recognize that in ourselves, whether it's from a fear of change, whether it's from um, a fear of uncertainty, not knowing where we're going to get our next income from, you know, there's a whole wide range of things, you know, why we stay. Um, one of the key elements is the brain likes what's familiar. So sometimes even if things isn't aren't being helpful to you, to your growth, to your development, to your happiness, if it's familiar, it still feels safe. And so we end up taking, we end up in that space where we end up outstaying, you know, our welcome and, and then we're not actually performing at that really high level. And that's not just for our employees, right? As leaders, we need to recognize this too. If we're going to be as effective as we can be, we need to recognize that where we sit in an organization or where we sit in a team, that has a life cycle as well. And a lot of leaders fail to set up for that succession planning or fail to set up for the next step for the team once you're gone. And and Lynn shared an analogy that was shared with her, which was fantastic. And that's that we're all like fists in a bucket of water, right? So we come into an organization and we go in and we embed ourselves in there. But we should be able to remove our fist and have people feel like we've never been there, right? So we should be able to come out of that organization and have everything come back in and still really work smoothly, But the key is, is even though we're not there and things go back into a status quo, as a great leader, we want to leave the water enriched by having been there. So that's the key, whether we're there for, you know, a a purpose, whether we're there for a long time, a short time, the whole purpose of being there is to have been in that space, served as best we can, grow in the team, developed the business, if we can create some really high productivity and profit margins. And then when we feel like, oh, my task here is done, recognizing that and going on to the next thing that that might be another project within the business or another position, or it might be another role completely, but we're better off recognizing that rather than saying somewhere going stale and then creating that toxicity around us. And I think the key element is as a leader, we really have to realize we can't make it all about us. It's not all about us. It's about the best thing for the people around us. It's that community level thinking and thinking what's the best thing for the team and what's the best thing for the um, organization. So then we did go on to talk about a little bit of ego, right? Because sometimes we do overestimate our presence and we think that we, we're creating this world that we think needs us and they don't really need us, right? And and that's driven a lot of the time by our ego. And I've done a lot of work on this and I loved what Lynn said. And she said, the ego is a part of being human. We don't want to get rid of the ego, but we can just recognize the ego, right? And I've done that a little bit now and, and things will happen. I'll go, oh, my ego liked that. But it's it's being in a space where we're using our ego to still give us co- um, confidence but not give us cockiness. So it's finding that fine line and knowing which side to step on it. And, and understanding your ego is a really key element to understanding yourself. So as a leader, are you are the meetings, do they have to be at that particular time and run that particular way because that feeds your ego? Or is that beneficial to the team? Hmm, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You know, those are the things that we can sit down and reflect. How this operates, is that because I'm wanting it to operate that way or is that because it's the best way for the team? And a lot of the time we just have to ask. We just have to get the feedback and we just have to ask and that will give us some clarity in that space. Um, And so I think that kind of 
nicely wraps up um, in a recap my interview with Lynn. I loved chatting with Lynn and I even love catching up for um, coffee catch-ups with her. It's always a great conversation. I feel like there's a really nice alignment there with the way that she leads. Um, I really respect that. And, and I love as well how she looks beyond what she can see you know she she has that understanding that people can see things and feel things rather and that um there's the things you don't see it's the body language it's the way people present it's their authenticity it's you know their trust and their integrity it's those things that actually make up the character of people and they're equally as important at the end of the day as the performance that people are putting out because when you get that right then the performance will just come through. And that's how you create that um, superstar team rather than the team of superstars. So definitely jump over, have a bit of a chat um, or have a bit of a chat rather, have a bit of a listen to that interview. And if you do want to have a chat um, with, with Lynn, then all of the details are in the show notes or you can reach out to me and I'm happy to connect you with her. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you enjoy the interview as well. And at this point, I'm going to say goodbye and I look forward to serving you in our next episode. Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our next episode.